septic is done. Finally. It took a lot more videos than I thought it would. So, I want to do a capstone. Kind of a system overview and setup and maintenance video. One to kind of wrap the project up and cover the whole thing in one place. And two, because there's a lot of things in here that I had a lot of trouble finding information on when I was researching how to do this build, particularly with system setup. Uh, I don't think this exact design is super common, which is part of that, but still, maybe somebody out there wants to build something similar or has something similar and wants to know how it works and how it was set up and how uh, to maintain it. So yeah, we're going to start with a system overview. Just uh, go through what's here, kind of in an, in, a, in an order that makes sense, because as I built it over the past many videos, uh, I did it in, in order that was dictated by the parts that I had, the tools that were available, not necessarily the sequence um, that the effluent is going to travel through the system. So hopefully it'll make a little more sense, all done in one, in one pass through. And yeah, let's just go through it. So this is the tanks. This is a lot of the system right in this area here. Um, and it all starts there. Underground, um, two feet down or so, there's a four inch. It's called SDR 35. It's a light, it's a thin wall um, sewage rated uh, PVC pipe is the system entrance. And it just goes out here and ends at the cap. The plan is that eventually there's going to be a house up here and when I build that, when it's time to hook that up to the septic, uh, this has been buried in sand, there's no big rocks or roots or anything so I can dig that up easily and then can, and then I'll cut the cap off and connect right there and then all of the uh, wastewater from the house will flow directly into this first tank right here through a four inch PVC line. Just before the tank, it tees and comes up to this. Uh, long term, this is going to just be a cap, a four inch cap, and that's called a clean out or an RV dump. Uh, clean out is, the idea behind clean out is that you can take that cap off and snake the drain to, to, to clean out clogs or what have you. Um, that's a little bit silly here since it's one foot from the septic tank. There's virtually no chance that it will clog right there. Uh, but that's the term. Uh, RV dump is more accurate, especially for what I'm using it for right now. Right now I live in a travel trailer, um, and it's got a gray water tank and a black water tank. And so in the interim, before the house exists, uh, this black garden hose is my uh, wastewater hose. And that leads to the, uh, on the travel trailer, I have a, a small grinder pump that takes all the gray and black water and grinds it up and pumps it through this hose. And then I built a little hydrant here that the hose hooks up to with, with a brass fitting. And then I put, this is just a vent. Um, I, I've never seen somebody do one of those before. Nobody told me to do that, but it just made sense to me. It just, it's just a, whatever, a three quarter inch piece of PVC with a U on the top so it can't rain into it. And there's a screen up there so bugs can't get in. Um, and it kind of is like the vent stacks through the roof of your house, but of course I don't have a house yet, and so there was there was nothing, and you know I can't imagine it actually causing a problem, but there's changing volume in these tanks underground. There's there's wastewater being pumped into the system, and there's wastewater being treated, wastewater being pumped out of the system. So. I wanted some way for that pressure to equalize, and that's, that's what this is, that's all it is, it's just a, an air vent so that any changes in volume underground can get makeup air or push out air, and it, it goes up high enough that it doesn't create a nuisance or odor. So that's the entrance to the system. So the four inch pipe goes into, this, this is one. 1,000 gallon ish concrete tank underground that's partitioned into two sections. The first one is about 710 gallons, the next one is 340, so it's a little more than a thousand. 
Um, the whole point in life of this tank is, this is something that was a little surprising to me and I think is surprising to a lot of people, is the what treatment means in a septic system. Right? I think people have in their head this idea of there's microorganisms and bacteria that break down the waste and the food and everything else and turns it into a, a less harmful, nicer something that goes out to the drain field and disappears, just goes away. Uh, that's not really what happens. There are uh, bacteria, microorganisms, there's breakdown that happens and it's part of the process, but it's not my understanding is that that's not a hugely significant part of the process. This tank does the bulk of um, what's considered treatment. Um, wastewater comes in and what is called treated effluent comes out. All that means is that this separates the wastewater into three parts. There's solids, that's poop and food waste and anything else that's solid and sinks that goes down your drain. Um, scum, which is like soap and grease and uh, toilet paper breaks down pretty well, but some of it contributes to the scum layer. And that, that's all stuff that floats. And then effluent, which is the liquid. And that's the vast majority of the wastewater that comes out of a residential home is fluid between laundry and dishes and showers and every toilet flush, the vast majority of it's water. Um, the, the fluids, the liquids that enter this system are the vast majority of the volume that it has to deal with. So with a conventional septic system or one like this or whatever, what these two tanks do is they let the three layers separate and then it lets the liquid through. And that's very simple. The way that works is there's just, it's called a baffle. It's just a T, a vertically oriented. The output pipe for this tank comes out the side, and when it goes in, there's a T on it. And so, and it's relatively high in the tank. And so fluid travels up the bottom of the T and out the pipe, and the T blocks the scum from getting out. And then, of course, solids sink to the bottom. And so this tank is large enough that the output from the house doesn't stir it all up every time you flush a toilet or take a shower. And so it just sits there. And the solids precipitate out and they sink to the bottom and the scum floats to the top and creates a layer. And it just, the longer it sits, the better the separation is, the, the more clear the fluid is. Um, and the reason there's two tanks is just to kind of double up on that process. So it enters this bigger uh, tank, it sits, the solids settle, the scum floats, effluent moves into the second tank, it's not very, you know, it's pretty well settled at that point, but the idea is then it does it all again and you get better results. And then in the output baffle for the second tank, there is a filter, and filter's kind of a loose term in septic, it's not, don't think like a furnace filter, it's a screen with 1 16th inch gaps. You can clearly see through it. Um, and that's just to make sure no chunks of anything happen if they're stirred up or whatever happened to get through. So that's it. This tank, that's the treatment that happens in septic. And over time, the solid layer on the bottom and the scum layer on the top get thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. And the amount of area in the middle that's where the, where the effluent is passing through and moving on gets smaller. And that's why every so often you have to have your tank pumped. So, out of the secondary tank, there's more four inch plumbing. You saw me make that, it just comes out. There's a 90, and then another 90, and then it enters this tank. This is a single compartment thousand gallon, it's called a pump tank. It's just a, it's just a tank with an inlet and no outlet. Inside here, under this lid, there's a pump vault. You saw me make that too. That is just a fiberglass sub tank. And this just fills with, they call it treated effluent. It is just fluid that passes through your, your septic system. It is um, treated. It is safe. It's not safe to just disperse on the top of the ground and have your kids and dogs playing in. 
but it is safe to distribute to a drain field underground where it can percolate through the soil and, and uh, be filtered out uh, underground and distributed to the groundwater and then filtered before it gets to the deep groundwater, which then people may have wells where they get their drinking water. By that point, it's, it is actually safe. Um, in the pump vault, there is another filter. It's just a bigger version of the one that's on the output of the second settling tank. And by bigger, I mean much bigger. The one on the settling tank is a cartridge about like that. The one on the on the pump is is like 16 inches diameter and two feet tall. It's a, it's a huge drum. Uh, but it filters again before it lets effluent pass through into a chamber where a uh, pump sits. And there's a set of floats to measure the level of the effluent in the tank. And we're going to talk about all the, the floats in the setup. But it just, though those floats tell the control system when to run the pump. And the pump pumps effluent up and out of that tank and out to the drain field. And it goes through this, which is a headworks box. This contains gauges and valves and yet another filter uh, that is the last line of defense before the effluent leaves this area goes that way and gets distributed to a drain field. Right here under these rocks are my manifolds. So the effluent from the, the tanks are over there behind you um, and the transport lines that bring the effluent from the tanks out to the drain field uh, run right underneath the camera there and then take a gentle turn and run up under these rocks in two manifolds. The effluent comes in on the supply manifold, gets split four ways, it runs through the drain field dosing, and I'll talk about the, how the emitters work in a second, but they, uh, some of that effluent dribbles and drips into the soil in, in this large area, and then the loops come back to a return manifold that is also takes all four of the um, return lines and combines them into a manifold and then returns to the tank because every dose the tank pumps substantially more effluent than will be distributed into the field and the remainder returns to the tank. Um, this was probably the hardest part to wrap my head around with this design. It took me a while to some research to understand this. The best way to understand it is to understand a little bit of the iterations of system design that got here. So the original pressure drip line systems, the first time they started using pumps to distribute effluent more evenly to a drain field, uh, it was just a pipe came out of the tank and it went to a drain field like this and it's the, the drip line just went out and it didn't return. It just you pumped out 60 gallons and 60 gallons went into the field. Uh, they had problems with those systems because the emitters in the drain line <clears throat> are pressure compensating valves. They're, they're, they're complicated little diaphragm, not complicated, they're, they're, they're pretty simple, but they're small parts and they can clog. They're, you don't, that's why there's so many filters in the system. If you get solids into those emitters, they clog, they don't work anymore, and you have a problem. And um, the, the effluent is not truly clean. There are solids in it. There are, um, they're in solution. They're suspended in the fluid, but if you took a jar of this stuff and you set it um, on a windowsill for six months, you know, some of that stuff would precipitate out and create a layer on the bottom of gunk. The ability of a fluid to suspend solids is primarily dependent on its velocity. To throw a lot of terms at you there. This it just makes sense. Like if you are making chocolate milk, pour the pour the chocolate in the milk and then you shake it, right? And then that suspends the chocolate in the milk. And if you let it sit too long, it'll settle back down, but you shake it again. So if it's moving, it can churn up this stuff. If it stops moving, the stuff can start to precipitate out. 
And so what was happening in these old systems is, if you can imagine, a, a long length of, of pipe with emitters every foot or two feet or whatever it is. And you pressurize it. You're pumping a gallon a minute through this thing. And then they all start dribbling. That first emitter is going to see a gallon a minute of effluent moving past it. But then the next one's going to see a little bit less because the first one dripped. And the next one's going to see a little bit less because the next one dripped. And the next one's going to see a little bit less. And your flow rate across that length of plumbing is going to decrease all the way into the end where it's zero. And this makes sense. The last emitter dribbles and then there's nothing. There's a plug. So there has to be zero flow at the end where it's plugged up. So it's flowing fast as it goes in and gets slower and slower and slower. As it slows down, the capacity of the fluid to to maintain solids and suspension decreases. And so they would start to settle out and this scummy film would build up inside the drip line towards the end where the flow got slow. And then that scum would start to clog emitters and cause problems. So to solve this issue, the next iteration is they built some systems and this works but they built some systems with a return line and they did loops of emitters or loops of drip line to a return manifold and back to the tank. And then they put a valve in there and closed that valve so that most of the year it did just like an old system where it dosed the drain field and the flow at the end of the end of the pipe was zero. And it takes time for that scum to build up to be a problem. And then there was a maintenance schedule every six months or every year, every so often, you would go out and you would open that valve and you would dose the system and it would flush it. It would take effluent and it would send it scouring down those pipes and rushing back to the, to the tanks at a high velocity and that would excite all of the scum in there and get it into solution and flush it and dump it back in the tank and get it out of the drip line and prevent it from clogging. And this works. It's something you have to remember to do, it's maintenance. Uh, they made some systems with computers on them and solenoid valves so that it, it, it knew when every hundred cycles it would open that valve and do one cycle where it didn't dose the field, it just flushed. Um, but that was, that was an iteration of the system to solve that problem. This is an iteration on that and it's called a continuous flush system. And that means that every dose it flushes. So. The downside of that is that you need a bigger pump. You need a pump that can handle a lot more volume than the previous iteration. But that's just about the only downside. Uh, by pumping far more effluent into this system than it can dose with, you, you have two requirements for this kind of system. The entire system has to be above a certain pressure for the drip line to dose. And the entire system has to be above a certain flow rate for the system to scour, for it to clean itself. And as long as you can do both those things every time, then it just works. So that is this, this is a continuous flush system. This has a supply line and a supply manifold, four loops, and a return. And so every time that pump runs, most of the effluent that is coming out into this field is going right back to the tank only a portion of it doses, but we set those numbers. We have control with valves and timers and things of that nature to set up this system so that it doses with the volume that we want to dose with and that it provides enough flow rate to clean itself and everything just works. So that is why there is a return line on this system. And this is my drain field. Ferns are growing lovely. So this is a large area um, where six to eight inches below the surface of the ground, fairly shallow, there is a 457 feet of half inch drip line buried in a, in a pattern, evenly spaced. And that drip line every two feet on it has a little nozzle, a little emitter um, that when the plumbing is pressurized, that emitter just drips at a fixed rate. So the whole point of that 
is that it takes a dose of effluent coming from the tanks through the manifolds and distributes it very evenly across this entire area. Uh, the reason my system is more complicated than many is because my soils aren't very good. Uh, we, we searched this property and this spot is the best soil on the property, but it's still only so-so. Um, a simpler septic system might, like a gravity system, might just, instead of having a pump tank and all the manifolds, well, some of the manifolds, but all the gauges and pressures and things, would just have the treated effluent would just roll downhill out of the tank and then it would be it would go to perforated pipes laid in a large area but those don't do a very good job of distributing a lot of effluent comes out at the first perforations and less and less and less and very little makes it all, all the way to the end of the field um, and because of that uh, the soil has to be better to cope with the uneven load. The, the, the part that gets overdosed has to not clog up. That's what happens. You can, you can clog a drain field. Um, if you have a single spot of earth underground, what, however deep, and you put too much effluent into it, uh, it stays saturated, it doesn't filter out properly the, 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 the small tiny solids that, that make it through the system in the tra treated effluent, uh, fill up the cavities in the soil, it no longer filters, it, it clogs, it doesn't, it doesn't work to distribute the effluent into the environment anymore. Uh, so, and also those, those systems, whereas I have little half inch pipe, those systems are usually four inch pipe or uh, what are called infiltrators, which are these chambers that are, I don't know, a foot tall or eight inches tall and two feet wide that get buried. And so they have to be buried deeper and take up more area. And if you dig on this property and you go down three feet, you're in clay. You're in hard, they call it hard pan. Um, that is a soil type that does not percolate. You can dig a three foot deep hole on this property and pour a bucket of water in it. And a week later, that water will be sitting in there. The soil is, is waterproof. And that's bad for a drain field. You do not want that. And so it was really important that my distribution system be shallow because I only have about two feet of good soil and you need three to do a conventional gravity system. So in that two feet, if you had to dig down a foot and a half just to install the system, you've only got six inches of good soil left before you're out. So going with a system that was very shallowly buried allowed me to have a lot more soil underneath the, the plumbing to absorb the effluent, to filter the effluent, not absorb, but filter the effluent. And also the pressure system gave me much more even distribution. So this entire field will be dosed very evenly. And each square foot of soil will have the minimum load possible. Uh, there will be no, no single area that's getting overdosed. That's the goal. That's why the system is more complicated. So, uh, so far it's working great. And all the research backs it up and I've been through the whole thing with the install and I buy it. So. I think it's I think it's gonna be good the last component to talk about on this system are these so we are at the end of the supply and return manifolds these rocks are the line above the manifold the drain field is to my right and the effluent comes in and leaves the manifolds from the far end this is the and the grade of the property this is important the grade of the property is downhill this way so this is the highest point of the entire system. And at the highest point of the system, you install what is called an air vacuum breaker. And you probably can't see that, but inside these little compartments, there's just a little component. And it's not complicated. It's just a, it's just a, a fluid check valve. 
it's a it's a chamber with a ping pong ball in it essentially and a ceiling seat above the ping pong ball and so gravity drops the ping pong ball away from the seat and air can enter or leave this valve either direction but fluid will float the ball and press it against the seat and seal it so this can squirt out air in the lines when the when the pump turns on there's some air in the lines and that air can escape through this valve so you're not forcing it through your emitters underground which wouldn't really hurt anything but you don't need to do so it, it can squirt out through those but as soon as the effluent reaches it the ball floats it seals and you can build pressure to make the drain field work and then when the pump turns off that ball falls again and air can be sucked in through here and that allows the fluid to drain back into the tanks without pulling a vacuum. It's called a vacuum breaker because it prevents the system from pulling a vacuum. The reason you don't want the system to pull a vacuum is because then it would actually try and suck backwards through the emitters in the drain field. And that could pull dirt because it's buried in dirt that could pull dirt into those nozzles and clog them. So as long as the highest point in the system, and this is the return and that is the supply, they're the exact same, it's just one for each manifold. Those are the two highest points in the system. That is where air could get trapped. Um, whenever it drains, this breaks the vacuum and lets it freely drain and prevents it from causing an issue uh, out in the drain field. All right, let's talk about system setup. The first thing you're going to do, first thing I did to set up this system is to set up the floats. We're at the pump tank here. This is the control panel. There are three floats in here and they tell the computer what it needs to do to make decisions about when to run the pump. It's fairly simple, but uh, let's go over it anyway. First, we're going to remove this lid. By default, these that I've seen, with the plastic lids at least, use a, I don't know what it is, number 12, number 14, uh, stainless steel flathead screw with a number three Robertson Square drive. I don't like them. The square, I mean, the square drive and the stainless. So stainless is good because it doesn't rust, but it's soft. And inevitably, the square drive in the head it fills with dirt and sand and whatever and then your bit doesn't get full engagement and then you strip it because the stainless is soft so i replaced all mine with m6 hex heads machine threads aren't very strong in plastic how strong does it need to be it's a lid anyway those are alloy steel they're dip spin coated, so they got a thousand hour salt spray rating. Honestly, it's better than the crappy stainless they probably use for the other screws. And yeah, no, I, I, all three of my lids have those and I like them. All right. There's the float tree. You see that okay? There are three floats on here. Short length of wire and they tip up and down. They have a mercury switch inside that makes contact with, yeah, they, they know when they're up or when they're down. Um, there are three of them, they're all important, but the middle one does all the work. To end under normal operation, when the system is working, the middle float is, tells the system when it's, I'm full enough to pump out or I'm not full enough to pump out. Because most of the time, the, the fluid level is at a certain height. And then as you use 
your house, so you take showers and wash clothes and what have you, it rises and rises and rises and rises. And once it reaches a certain level, the pump will run for a set amount of time and bring it back down. And it works within this range. If you, I don't know, host a big Thanksgiving dinner and you have 20 people at your house using the fixtures way more often than usual, um, you can outrun the rate at which this will dose the field. And that's why this is, that's why there's a tank here. That's why there's a thousand gallons of volume available is so that you can put a bunch in here and nothing bad happens. And then everybody goes home and the weekend after Thanksgiving, or the week after Thanksgiving, um, the system will dose and dose and dose and dose as often as it's designed to until the level has gotten back down to the middle float. The bottom float is called redundant off. And it basically, as far as the system's concerned, should always be up. It should never, the, the fluid level should never drop down so far that this float tips down. Um, the scenario where that might happen is if the middle float fails. If the middle float thinks it's up all the time, even when it's not, because there's been a failure, the pump will run and run and run and it'll keep pumping the system down. And so if those two are up and then if it thinks those two are up and the bottom one drops, it'll stop pumping because that indicates a failure with the middle one. That's good because if it were to keep pumping, it would empty the tank. And once the fluid level dropped below the intake of the pump, the pump would run dry and burn itself up. So that's what that, that exists to protect the pump. The top one is the alarm. It is set at a height that you don't want it to get to, that is more than a Thanksgiving weekend of hosting above the middle one. And it also indicates some kind of a failure. When it tips up, it sounds a siren. There's a test button. Makes a really annoying noise. Gets you up in the middle of the night. And it tells you that something's wrong with your system. It's too full. Probably your pump has failed. Maybe your middle float has failed, but you need to figure it out because you currently don't have a working system and it's gotten too full. Or you had a Thanksgiving you never planned on and you can come out here and verify that everything's working and then silence the alarm and then the system will catch back up. So I didn't find a lot of guidance on where to set these. I think there's a lot of elbow room, but I did find from a manufacturer a couple of recommendations. They suggested the bottom float be three inches above the top of the filter. Uh, I started there and it just didn't, it didn't have a lot of play. I wasn't comfortable with it, so I moved it up to about four inches. Um, the middle floats three inches above that. You want those as low as possible because that gives you more uh, tank volume to play with. The recommendation I heard for the alarm was that it should be a full day's use plus two inches above the middle one. So if you use two days worth of water in one day, it would go off. Um, I took some measurements and I did some math and I figured that that's about 18 inches for me. That's not the math. That's easy. Um, that's about 18 inches for me. At 18 inches, that float was only about two inches below the intake of the tank. Um, I didn't like that. That didn't give me a lot of time. If this alarm goes off, I want to have additional reserve capacity in this tank so that I can deal with whatever the problem is. If this pump is burned up and I order one, you know, it might take two days to get to me. And I don't want to you know, have an emergency situation where I, I, my system can't handle two days worth of water while I'm waiting for parts. And of course, you have, you know, you have an issue with your septic and you can serve water, say, hey, don't do laundry until this is fixed, uh, you know, take military showers, whatever. Um, but still, the more capacity you have, the more leeway you have, the less stress you have when you have an issue. So I set mine at about 10 inches instead of 18. And that gives me like, I, th I think I figured two and a half days of full bore water usage, which 
we're not going to be doing on a regular basis. That's system capacity. Before, between when the alarm goes off and when the tank is full. I'm a lot more comfortable with that. The trade-off is that I may get nuisance trips. I may have this go off when there's nothing wrong after Thanksgiving, as my redundant example. Um, and I'm just going to see how it goes. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it here, and I know that I can, I can, whenever I want, I can pull this up and I can raise this a couple inches and tweak the position. But the trade-off is going to be if I'm sick of hearing the alarm and it's going off when nothing's wrong, I can raise it. But every time I raise it, I lose capacity for when it's not working. So that's the trade-off, and that's how you set up the floats. So that's step one. You get those three floats set where you want them, and then you move on to setting up the headworks box. This is the headworks box. There's a couple of things going on here. So the pump chamber is that way. You see my finger? That way. Um, from the, the pump is plumbed to here. There's a, a pressure gauge. The filter. There's another pressure gauge. There's a flow meter. And then it goes out to the drain field. The return line from the drain field comes in here. There's another pressure gauge. There's a valve. And then it goes back to the tank. That's this tank. Or that's this box. So the next step is to set all of this up. The first thing you do with this is you start with the valve wide open. And this is in commissioning of the system. So right now, your, both your tanks should be full of water. Nobody's used the system yet, it's all clean. Um, <coughs> but you're getting it set up and you haven't you know, passed inspection yet, so you shouldn't be using the system. Um, you open the valve, this valve, full, and you run the pump. You run it for several minutes at least. And you get water circulating through your whole system. And with that valve full open, um, you're not going to be reaching much pressure. You're just going to be flowing. It's similar to a, uh, a flush cycle on a previous generation system. So you, some of your emitters, some of the early emitters in your system may be dosing, but not most of them aren't. It's just water flowing through the whole circuit. And the point of this is to just kind of clean stuff. Um, you've done your best for the whole build to keep junk out. There shouldn't be drill shavings in your tanks. There shouldn't be deburr bits of plastic floating around in all your pipes. You shouldn't have gotten any dirt in while you were making connections. But you're doing your best, and you're working in the dirt and the mud, and you're drilling and cutting. So stuff happens. Things get in. So you run the system for a while, and then you shut it off, and you clean the filter. So the idea is that anything that was in the system got flushed and cycled through and caught there. So the next step is to just take a measurement. What is the rate of flow? The question you're answering is, what is the rate of flow that your drain field, as built, doses at? And so you turn on the pump, and then you slowly close the valve. You don't want to just close the valve and turn on the pump because it's just spikes in pressure. It's just hard on the components. It would, probably wouldn't break anything, but it's bad practice. So you leave the valve open, you turn on the pump, you slowly close the valve all the way. Once that valve is closed all the way, you're going to see really high pressures. Well, not, not crazy high, but you know, higher than it will be in service. Kind of in the, I don't know, 60, 80 PSI range. I forget what the numbers were. The, the pressures aren't really very important. With this closed, you want to get out a stopwatch and you want to measure the flow rate at this flow meter. It just, it just counts a volume. It's just like your water meter or your electric meter. It just tells you an amount. It doesn't tell you a rate. So you have to take a reading, start a stopwatch, wait five gallons, stop the start watch, do the math. 
Uh, mine was about 4.9 gallons per minute going to the drain field. And you write that number down because you're going to need it in a minute. So then, once you have that number, you take this valve and you slowly start to open it. And you can see the pressures drop as it's relieved, as it's allowed to flow back to the tank. And you watch gauge three here, which is the one measuring the return side. And you want to set, you want to open that until it settles at about 10 psi. Um, what you're doing here is you're setting the pressure in the drain field. You're making sure there's enough pressure throughout the entire drain field that all of the emitters are working. The emitters, in my drip line at least, are pressure compensating. That means that as long as they have somewhere between 7 and 45 PSI, they drip at the same rate. So if one has 7 and one has 45, the, the 45 pressure one isn't going to dose any faster than the 7 is. They're going to just all dribble the same, and that's what you want. You want even distribution. So setting this to 10 ensures that the entire drain field is more than this. This will be the lowest point in the system. These, these gauges will read much higher because every elbow, every foot of pipe, every turn, every seam pressure drops a little bit. It's called head loss. Um, whatever your pressure is at the inlet will be higher. It'll slowly decrease anywhere you measure it along the entire system. It'll get lower and lower and lower until that point where it's going to be the lowest. Well, it's going to be lowest right at the tank, but that's pretty much the lowest. You know that everything upstream of that is a higher pressure. So you set that to 10 psi. You know your whole drain field is more than 10 psi. That means that all the emitters are going to be working. I set mine to about 12 and a half, gave myself a little elbow room. That sets this valve's position. Now that's all set up. The next thing you want to do is you want, there's no way to set this, but you want to check your flow rate. You want to know that there's enough velocity through the system to scour it. Because that's, we talked about this. That's how a continuous flush head works. works. Um, so, let me look it up. That's published by the manufacturer. Somebody's done all this figuring. Some scientists have looked at tons and tons of systems and figured out what works and what doesn't work. So you don't have to. I have half-inch drip line. And according to the table, 3.2 gallons per minute of flow rate will scour treated effluent, which is what I have. It's treated, it's settled. Double that, 6.4, um, is for untreated. So that would clean even if we were just dumping straight wastewater in there. But I need 3.2 gallons a minute. At least, more is better. The faster it is, the cleaner it'll be. So you want more. So you run the water again, and you do the stopwatch thing again, and you watch your, your flow meter, and you measure the flow rate through the system. And mine was 13.2 gallons a minute. You know that some of that is getting left out there. For me, it was 4.9. So that means that I have 8.3 gallons a minute of flow returning, which is the flow with the valve open minus the flow with the valve closed. And I only need 3.2. So I have plenty. I have triple what I need. Not quite. I have almost triple what I need, and more is better. So that's good. If it had been close, I would have played with this a little bit, brought that right down to 10. Remember, it was a little extra, 12 and a half. But I have margin on the pressure. I have margin on the flow rate. So I know everything is good. The headworks is set up. The last thing I did to check, just kind of for my own information, is these two gauges, one and two here measure the pressure before and after the filter. And I measured those with a clean, clean filter just to get the difference. And it's about three PSI. So I know when I do maintenance on the system, if I look at this while it's running and I see five, six, eight, ten PSI difference between these two gauges, it means my filter's clogged. I need to clean it. That's good information to have. I don't need it yet, 
but I took it as part of the uh, setup. The last thing to set up are the timers. So this is the control panel. It knows what the level of the water in the tank is and it has, it knows what time it is. It has timers built into the computer and the headworks is all set up. So the last thing to do is to set up the dose. My design based on soils in the area, I hired a licensed designer to uh, look all this up and do all the math and figure, figure everything out based on the soil composition of my land and the health department guidelines and whatever else. Uh, she has determined that my drain field can handle uh, 360 gallons a day and it is to be dosed 12 times, so every two hours, at 30 gallons per dose. That's the, that's just in the design. I didn't make any of those decisions. I seems perfectly reasonable to me, uh, but that is, that is the target. So I need to now set this up so it knows when to run, but it doesn't know for how long to run. So I need to figure out how long it takes with my pump and my plumbing and my drain field to pump 30 gallons out of this tank. I also know from the tank manufacturer that it is 22 and a quarter gallons per inch in this thousand gallon tank. So all I need to do now is to figure out how long it takes to pump the water level in this tank down 1.35 inches. That's a, a, was a lot of guess and check. It is not a great slick way to do it. And it's trickier still because the um, plumbing drains. So when this pump runs, it fills up all the plumbing to the drain field. And then it doses. And then when it stops pumping, the effluent volume within the plumbing slow, slowly, relatively slowly, drains back into the tank. Um, so if I measure, if I were to come out in the morning, and this hasn't run all night, and I were to measure the water level, and it's just water in there at this point, so you stick a tape measure in there, it's not gross, it's not tricky. You stick a tape measure in there, you measure the water level, I run the pump until it's down 1.35 inches and then stop it with a stopwatch, that's not the right answer. Because then I could sit there for 20 minutes and watch as the water level slowly came up as water came out of the system and went back into the tank. So I took an educated guess on where I should be. I think it was a minute 40-ish of dose. And I set this panel up to run the pump for a minute and 40. And I measured the water level. I ran it for a minute 40. And then I waited for like an hour. And I measured the water level again. And I got a reliable delta change and I could do the math and figure out, oh no, I pumped 38 gallons instead of 30. I need to reduce the number. And so I'd change the number and I'd do it again. I did like six iterations of this while I was doing other stuff. I wasn't sitting here in a lawn chair waiting for an hour and like, I, I, it, was, it was fine. It wasn't that bad. Um, and eventually it all, it all kind of converged. And for me, it was a six minute and 10 second dose. My, uh, my drain field is a little thirstier I guess you could say. There's manufacturer published values for how what the gallons per hour of each emitter should be. Uh, mine doses a little bit faster than that. That's fine. I just set a lower timer because the volume is what matters, not the rate. So um, six minutes and 10 seconds per dose. And then I set a wait time of an hour 53.50, which is two hours minus six minutes and 10 seconds. And this, so this control panel, if you open it up, this is pretty slick. I'm, I wasn't happy that this was specced when I, when I got the design for the septic. I wanted something dumb. I wanted something simple with just three relays and no smarts at all. And I got this, which is a computer with touch screen and buttons and it doesn't have a touch screen, but it's a, a readout and buttons and manuals and certifications it, it was, I wasn't I wasn't thrilled I wanted something simpler because to me there's a lot to go wrong here but so far it has worked flawlessly the quality of the this is this is the first enclosure that I've purchased ever 
that is rated for outdoor use that I feel like is acceptable for outdoor use, if that makes sense. My power meter, very expensive industrial piece of hardware that everybody in the industry uses, rated for outdoor use. I got it, I looked at it, and it's just got big holes in it. In the top, it, water can just get right in. I, I built a roof over it. I, I was not comfortable with that. But this is, this is good. This has seals, no rings, sturdy construction. And yeah, it has a menu with a whole host of 12 options here with doses and cycle counts and tells you what floats are up and what's are down. Run it manually, automatically, turn it off. And do whatever you want here. So there's my off timer. It is set for 153.50. If I come through here and go to my on timer, it is set for 610. That is what I set up as part of that exercise. And that's all. There's more in here. There's stuff like um, the time until the next dose that you can look up. There's a cycle counter that, tell, that tells me that this has run 37 times total since I built it. Um, there's a lot in here. But as far as setting it up, you just set those two times and you're done. And so now whenever this thing gets full enough that the floats that we set up tell it, it'll pump 30 gallons out to the drain field at a correct pressure and flow because we set up the headworks box. And then it'll wait and it'll do it every two hours until it's down to an acceptable level and then it waits. And that's it. The system is set up and that is everything that it is supposed to do. Uh, everything's set up, everything's working great. You saw my cycle counter at 37 cycles since construction. I should mention this has been built for five months and 21 of those cycles were from setup. So I've been utilizing this system at less than 1% of its design capacity. Uh, yeah, so it certainly doesn't need maintenance yet. I mean, trailer lifestyle is kind of definitionally water frugal, but yeah, it's nice to have a system that is over designed. I don't have to worry about overloading it because 360 gallons a day is a lot of water. I don't think that we're even in the uh, repetitive Thanksgiving giving example going to be exceeding that. Anyway, uh, the system maintenance for this is pretty straightforward. There are three filters. You clean them and you check the two air vacuum breakers. That's it. The two filters in the tanks are yearly. I clean them every 12 months. Mine aren't going to need it, but we'll do it now just to, just to do it. The filter in the headworks box has the gauges. So every year when I clean the other two, I will check those gauges and see if the uh, pressure drop across the filter has increased and clean it when it needs it. There is not, that I could find, there is not a manufacturer specification on acceptable pressure drop across a disc filter of that design. So I'm gonna guess and check a little bit. As I said, with totally clean water, it was three PSI. I'll probably clean it the first time it gets to five. And, and when I do, I'll see what it looks like. If it looks pretty gunky, that'll be my number. I'll clean it every time it gets to five. If it's super gunky, I'll do it at four. If it's pretty clean looking, Next time I'll do it at six or seven or eight. And I'll just kind of play around with it until uh, the filter looks like it needed it but wasn't that bad. And that'll be my uh, number going forward. We'll see how long it takes me to arrive at that number. But let's start with the easy ones. The first effluent filter is a piece of cake. It is small, it is light, it has an extended handle. So it's easy to get to. Don't leave your rubber gloves in the sun because they're kind of hot and gross, but they're less gross than what's in there, so we'll deal with it. And this is actually the first time I've had these open since I built it. And yeah, clean tiny bit of scum forming on this one. That one's pretty pretty darn clear. A little bit of aroma, but what do you expect? So let me get a garden hose. 
Yeah, that there. Hopefully that sound isn't distracting. All the filters, you want to clean off all the filters into the first chamber because the gunk then gets processed. So, pull straight out. <laughs> I mean, this is sort of a waste of time. That's pretty clean. I'll bring it over here. And close it off. That's it. And then it just pushes straight back in until it seats. One filter clean. This one is much larger. And the float tree kind of comes along for the ride. It just snaps on. Take it. Side of the side. Where it ain't gonna fall in. And then take this. And there's an input baffle on the tank you can just rest this on. Pretty convenient. Let's move the camera so you can see down in there. Not uh, too much to see, but see there's a little bit of this. See, that's not even. That's the uh, well water there. That's dissolved iron rusting, that orange. So I think it really says something that the uh, worst of the scum is well water, not poop. Yeah, splash some water on it. Until it's clean. I mean, clean-ish, it wouldn't eat off it. It goes back in. Let's check the Headworks filter. So I'm gonna turn the system on. There is in the control panel, there is a button called hand. It's for hand operation, I guess you'd call it. The, uh, the idea there is it overrides the timers. You don't have to put anything in the tank and wait for the timer to count down. You can just push a button and the pump will run until you push the button again. So we're gonna do that right now and check those gauges. All right, things spring to life. It's an HD camera, but the lighting's pretty poor, so I'm guessing you're not gonna be able to read this. Let's have a look, see. Needles are still moving a little bit. We haven't gotten up to pressure on the return yet, so it's still filling up the plumbing on the way out to the drain field. All right, it is stabilized and we are at 47 and 44. So not surprisingly, you're seeing the exact same three PSI drop that I saw in system setup because everything's still very clean. So this does not need to be cleaned. I'm gonna clean it anyway just because. I know I said we were done inside the tanks, but I lied. Back into the pump tank now. You can hear it draining back. That is the return side draining. The supply side doesn't. In order to get the flow rate and pressure Remember I talked about the continuous flush system needed a, needed a more substantial pump than the previous generation. To get that, we use, we use a well pump. Well pumps are very robust, they're affordable, really high performance, they're great pieces of hardware. So there's a well pump in here that supplies my drain field. It's a great fit for the application. One problem is that well, wells need check valves. So your pump goes so far underground, it has to pump water way up over 100 feet, maybe several hundred feet depending on where you live, before the water gets to your surface. And if you didn't have check valves in that vertical column 
where it's pumping out, every time the pump stops, the gravity would push the water backwards through the pump and cause it to spin backwards, which in and of itself doesn't hurt the pump. What does hurt the pump is if while that's happening, while it's wheeling backwards, if you were to use enough water that your system would demand more, and the pump tried to turn on forwards as it was spinning backwards, it can severely damage the pump. So they put check valves in them. There's a check valve built into the pump, and you put one every 100 feet coming up to the surface. So that when the pump stops, the water just sits there, and it doesn't flow backwards. In this system, where that is not a concern, where that pump will never run close together, it'll always be two, almost two hours between when that pump turns off and when it turns back on, it would make sense to me to defeat that check valve, to drill a hole in it. I asked the county, I asked my designer, I asked a professional septic installer, I asked the parts supplier. Every one of them told me not to do that. They all said that's a bad idea. Don't muck with it. So I didn't. I didn't get a satisfactory explanation for why not. But everyone agreed I shouldn't do it, so I didn't. As a result, that pipe there coming out of the pump is full of water. And it's full of water all the way up and through the headworks box and through the filter and 75 feet of transport line and 30 feet of manifold are all full. Which means if I go to take that filter apart to clean it, 100 feet of one inch? What is, how many gallons is that? A lot of treated effluent, which sounds a lot friendlier than it is, let's be honest, it's smelly poop water, will come gushing into my headwork, my insulated open cell foam clean and tidy headworks box will get flooded with that stuff. I wasn't very happy with that idea. So I installed a dump valve in here, sort of like the vent stack. I haven't seen this before, nobody told me to do it, but I did it. I'm glad I did. And it's this blue butterfly right here. And I open that, and that allows all of that fluid. See, you see how much is coming out of that? That would all be dumping in the headworks box through the filter housing. So I open that valve wait for it to stop dripping, then I'm going to clean the filter. Alright, I've never cleaned this filter before. I've never cleaned a disc filter before. I am not a fan of this design. In my head, this isn't going to be great. Like I said, I haven't done it before. So both the other filters have long handles. It stay well above the water line. And so like I put on gloves because working with a septic system, but they're dry. Well, other than my sweat, they're dry, right? I haven't gotten into anything smelly or nasty yet. But this, there's no getting away from. It is an upside down cup. And when I crack that seal, stuff's gonna get everywhere. There's drain holes in the bottom of this box, so it should get out again. But yeah, this is this to me is not serviceable design. But it's what was specified. It's what I was sold. It's what people do. Well, I asked my designer, I said, isn't this nasty? And she said, uh, oh, homeowners don't do that. They hire a professional who comes in with a hazmat suit and it's no big deal. And to me, hazmat suit screams big deal. Plus, I'm not keen on hiring other people to clean filters for me. That should be a manageable job. So, we're going to see how this goes. Disc filter. 
not dirty, not surprising. But when I do this next year, when it's been used all year, at a higher capacity, it probably will be. And I gather the way to clean this is to grab it, whatever it's covered with, swish it around in a bucket of clean water, put it back, separate all the discs and stuff. So, yeah, there's a little schmaltz on there. Honestly, it looks like plastic shavings, not nasties, not biological nasties. But yeah, this is definitely a rubber gloves job. Let me uh, agitate it under water here and get it clean. And then I'll show you how it works. It's kind of cool, actually. I like disc filters. I like the idea of disc filters. They're a neat way to build a filter. But I don't really care for this as a septic solution, as it were. But if you look at this, there's basically hundreds of little thin plastic discs in here. And each one, because I gotta focus on that, each one has micro grooves on it. And they're all little, well they're not all different, they're all, they're all kind of helix in a different direction so that they can't intermesh when it goes together. So when you seat them all, it creates thousands of tiny little long passages from the outside to the inside. And that is, so the, the junk collects on the outside and the clean goes to the inside. And that's the filter. And so it's not a fluff or a matrix or anything like that. It's a, it's a plastic, so it should be durable and it should last. And then when it's time to clean it, you separate them and you can actually swish it in around all those little gaps and ostensibly get it pretty clean. And honestly, that was a pretty, that was better than I thought it was going to be. Even, even it being not dirty because of lack of use. Um, it had a couple of things on it and they came off real easy. And yeah, it's ready to reinstall. So hopefully if that stays relatively clean, if that's not too gross, this won't be a big deal. But I still definitely prefer the other ones where you grab a handle that's two feet away from the yuck, garden hose it off and then put it back. You never, you never get close to it. Much more sanitary, it seems like. What do I know? I'm not a septic designer. So they provide a wrench, don't use it to tighten. It's just like an oil filter. Tighten it by hand then wrench it off. And that's it. I am going to turn on the pump, make sure that doesn't leak. No reason it should, but just be thorough. And unfortunately, I dripped some water in there while I was cleaning it, so I can't, it's not like I could see one drip but this gets up to like 40 PSI, so if it leaks, we'll see it. And there it is, like 40 PSI. We don't see it. Another thing to check annually is the function of the air vacuum breakers. These lids just turn and pop off. And this green cap here is just threads on. It's just to keep dirt out of there. And I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little plastic ball down in each one. And you're going to want to take a screwdriver or clean stick. Just kind of make sure that those little balls are free in there, bounce around, it's going to want to make sure there's not like a, a lot of gunk. If these were leaking and effluent was getting out every single time, 
Um, you probably see evidence of that. And then I'm gonna reinstall these little covers and go turn on the pump and make sure they don't leak. So I saw a little drip out of that one, but I don't think that's anything to be concerned about. And that there is, yep, you see the ball is up and against the seal, not free. I don't want to push on it too hard because you know, it might squirt me in the face. But you can see they're operating as they're supposed to be. I think a little, a little bit of drip past once they set each time is harmless. And yeah, they have both sealed done their job and we saw that with the water off they were both down and free and allowing air to enter the system so these are both working properly close them up forget about them for a year that's it that is the yearly maintenance for the septic system not so bad, especially when it's as clean as it was. Hopefully this has been informative for somebody. Covered the system overview, setup and maintenance. Now you know what I know. If I've missed anything, left anything out, provided any gross misinformation or regular misinformation, let me know in the comments. Hopefully, this is the last video you ever see about this septic system because it just works from here on out. Here's hoping.